Wouldn't you like to have buildings like these in your neighborhood? Well, I would. Hi, I'm Ranger Chuck Arning with the National Park Service here in the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And what is it about these buildings that draws us to them, that makes us stop and take notice? They have that one strong common denominator. I call it character, strength of purpose, resolute, firmness, being able to withstand the test of time. These buildings constitute the richness of our history. And they don't have to be as grand as the Ace of Waters Mansion behind me here in Millbury, Massachusetts. It can be as plain and as sturdy as the brick mill villages of Berkeley and Ashton in Cumberland, Rhode Island. These buildings have character. The Bancroft Memorial Library in Hopedale, the Grange Hall in Primrose, the Stagecoach Tavern in Chapachet. Each of these buildings has a sense of history. They are our community assets. Now grab hold of that concept community assets for a moment because throughout our communities, the preserving our history through its buildings and its architecture and its landscape is an ongoing battle. And yet there are some members of our communities willing to take on that challenge of preservation. So join me as we meet a few of our neighbors who are willing to fight the good fight and preserve our valley piece by piece. think about what is special about a place, um, what's special about a community. It could be a town common that's picturesque, or it could be a 200-year-old beech tree. It could be anything that sets that place apart and makes it special, makes it different from everywhere else. The key to this is always the average guy getting interested in this, uh, that to the extent that any of this, that there is a sense that any of this is imposed from above, that it's the federal government or the state government or whatever that is imposing a program, it doesn't work. It's one of those great American dreams to own a piece of real estate, to own your own home, to be able to work within a walking proximity. So it, again, I guess it, you know, just appears to me that historic neighborhoods offer some different kinds of benefits that sometimes new neighborhoods don't. I mean, there's a certain sort of ambiance and a certain sort of, you know, uh, sense of place that people really buy into. Historic neighborhoods, I think, tell something about why that place is what it is. There's usually something that you can see in a historic neighborhood that tells something about its past, how it came to be, by the different types of housing that you might see or commercial buildings. It tells something about its past. I think it makes people um, set their community apart from others. Why is preservation so important? What is it about America that we need to preserve? Well, to answer those questions, we talked with Arthur Bergeron of Historic Massachusetts earlier this summer. To me, preservation is really the root of every existing community. Uh, what preservation is about is about saying really two things, that first of all, every person wants to be proud of where they live, you know, where they are, and secondly, that a really, a really crucial part of that is where they came from where they came from personally, where their community came from, and that preservation is really about building community pride, about keeping communities together, and keeping communities from turning into simply stops on the interchange, which so many communities seem to have done by losing that kind of sense of focus on who they were and what they came from. So that's really what preservation is about. It's, about, it's certainly about economic forces and about trying to, to restore communities by restoring older buildings. But more than anything, it's about building community pride the really important role that the Park Service has played in this whole Blackstone Valley has been not in the programs and not in the dollars, in, in, that's insignificant, but in, in building the sense among people here of a common uh, destiny built on their common histories. The amount of participation that can come from a church or any non, a nonprofit or a group of citizens is so much greater than that that can come from a state or local or a federal government. You know? So I, I think 
the, the, the way to make it happen, it always has to come from these kind of grassroots, whether it is from an advocacy group that is trying to save a landscape or from a church, and churches are some of the most Im important buildings, or just a guy that wants to save an old fire station, or whatever. Now, Arthur, based on your long experience and your interest here in the Blackstone Valley, looking at the valley as a whole, what are some of the hot spots? What are some of the areas that we need to be concerned about as far as preservation of our landscape go over the next 10 years, say? You're about to experience this incredible boom resulting from the completion of the I-146 connector. And the, the great challenge is going to be to keep from having all of the open space that you have turn into just those rows and rows of suburban housing. Present zoning in most of these communities zones all of that land for that purpose. So trying to, to look at what you've got for zoning structures so that you can cause the money that's going to be pouring in here anyway, because you're going to, the land's going to get developed, right? Uh, unless you just buy it for open space, and I guess that's the second piece. Um, causing that investment that is going to occur anyway to in occur in a way that keeps you feeling as a community that you're living in this special place that hasn't that, that isn't completely different that's going to be your your greatest challenge but on the on the flip side of that it's a it's it's an exciting challenge because it's something over which communities really have power they have the you have the power right now proactively to shape how all of that money is going to get spent so the open space is the, the only asset which, if you don't acquire it now, doesn't increase in price at the rate of inflation. Everything else, you know, you, buy, you don't buy a school today, well, next year you can buy the same school for an additional 5%. You don't build a fire station today, add 5%. Take an acre of land and put two houses on it, and you're never going to take that, that acre of land for open space again, ever, 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 because the price just went up 20-fold, right? So if you, if you don't look at your acquisitions now, they're just going to go away. People in these communities owe it to their children right now to say 50 years is nothing. I have to save this community, not for me. I'm a steward for my children and my grandchildren. And I can do that right now because the, 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 the tools are all here. So I think that's, that, that, that's really what I would say. And the time is now. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Seems like a pretty decent little neighborhood, doesn't it? I would say decidedly upscale. So it's a little hard to imagine that 30 to 40 years ago, this was a slum. You got it, a dirty, nasty old slum. Type of place you wouldn't want to visit even in broad daylight. So how did a slummy area like this, yet a very significant historic neighborhood, turn into one of the major stepping stones for the revitalization of downtown Providence, Rhode Island? Well, that's a good question. And to find the answer, we're going to track down Arnold Robinson, the executive director of the Providence Preservation Society. And Arnold, as we look up and down the street, it is hard to imagine that 30, 40 years ago, this was a slum. What happened? Well, if you'd, if you'd come here back in uh, the 1950s, you would have seen burnt out houses, boarded up houses, you would have seen uh, um, open building sites. Uh, it was a wreck. And basically, it had been a neighborhood that had gone out of fashion, had been ignored, and um, it had become a worker tenement in the 20s and 30s. People began to sort of rent out the houses and cut them up into multi-unit buildings. And essentially, it was a neighborhood people forgot about. Um, what happened was that a bunch of the community got together and actually formed my organization, the Providence Preservation Society, and sort of rewrote the plan. Well, that's very impressive. Must have taken a while, though. Must have been quite a fight. Yeah, it's it, neighborhood, saving a neighborhood or redoing a neighborhood is a long, it's house by house. And what happened initially was folks who cared about history, who cared about architecture, went to the federal government, which was planning to demolish all the houses you see here. We're going to come down as a part of urban renewal. And they said, let's look at what other cities have done in the country, like Charleston and Savannah, and let's do it for a whole neighborhood. And they wrote the College Hill Plan with the, with the city and the federal government, which called for preservation instead of demolition. And that's what started it happening. The solution for this neighborhood, when it was threatened, came from the community. It wasn't a government planner. It wasn't anybody who sort of thought of the solution. But it was a group of folks who were all members of the Rhode Island Historical Society who said, gee, it's nice to, to know about the buildings, but we want to go save them. It's a great lesson in how if people get involved in determining their own fate for their neighborhood, they can make an enormous difference. I mean, not only did that effort save this neighborhood, it became a national model that's been used across the country for neighborhood preservation. Well, Arnold, this is an absolutely beautiful neighborhood, and it really is a community asset for the entire city of Providence. But it must be a difficult proposition to maintain it 
And as you said, keep it affordable. How do you, what's, how do you meet that challenge? Well, there's a couple of different ways that you do it. I mean, assets work in different ways. And in one sense, the architecture that was once threatened because people didn't want to take care of it, now people love it and buy it and take care of it themselves. So in a sense, the private property is pretty easy. The public realm is an interesting. How do you keep the, this open community asset? We do festivals and historic houses. We do walking tours um, to let people know this is their asset. This is their community to walk through and see the architecture and learn about their history. Um, that's one way that you definitely do it. I'd say the second lesson that came from this community asset is really this can happen in other neighborhoods. Um, and so we're out there sort of making the College Hill and Benefit Street example happen in other places, neighborhoods that have been forgotten, um, where just now people are starting to realize they're great places to live. Now, if you were to talk to the other communities in the Blackstone Valley and even nationwide, what would be the fundamental thing that you teach them about how to preserve a neighborhood? I think the most important lesson is people have to get involved individually. Um, we, for instance, work with 25 neighborhood groups throughout the city. Um, and bar none, the neighborhoods that have an active group of citizens who get out there, who live there, who buy houses, who, who play a role in, in some planting street trees, those are the neighborhoods that get better. Um, the neighborhood where they sort of try to get government to provide the solution or, or try to find one-stop shopping, it doesn't work. If the people aren't engaged and organized, um, it doesn't happen. I mean, here there were two key groups, the Preservation Society and the College Hill Neighborhood Association. Um, they got involved, they made it happen by recruiting new homeowners, by saving abandoned buildings, um, by investing their money and their time. What's the future of the neighborhood today? It's pretty secure right now. I mean, there's very little change here. Uh, this is a local historic district, so uh, changes have to get reviewed. Uh, homes are a lar in large percentage owner-occupied. People care about the street. Um, there's very little change in, uh, in threat. I think the biggest uh, issue is what happens in downtown. Uh, most residential neighborhoods, although they're set off, need to care about what happens in the downtown area because uh, in any community in Rhode Island, uh, as goes downtown, so goes the rest of the place. Now here's a perfect example of what a community asset is. It's the public school here in Quinsigmund Village in Worcester, Massachusetts. Strong, massive, reminiscent of the Romanesque revival design, the school built in 1891 represents an important community value, education. And the school still dominates the village today. The village of Quinsigmund is really just one large neighborhood. This is a map of Quinsigamond Village in 1870, and there are a couple of interesting things. It shows the portion of the Washburn and Mowen plant at that time. Uh, they had six company houses, duplex houses, starting up at the railroad crossing in Milbury Street, three houses. They had a brick building opposite the Stebbins Street that they called the laboratory and three company houses coming south on Mulberry Street. There was no fire station, and the Berg residence and the Deline residence were not built in those days. And there were no houses on Perry Street, or what is now called Falmouth Street. This shows you how the village built up in a comparatively few short years. Here's the company houses, here's the now American Steel and Wire Company, Washburn Mowen, their company houses, the laboratory company houses, and now the fire station is there, the Berg residence and the Deline residence, houses all along Falmouth Street here, or Perry Street in those days. My grandpa Holst was co-owner with his brother-in-law of this house. As the neighborhood grew, the need for a fire station became evident. The fire station was built just a few years after school, and the architecture here reflects the desire to build upon and enhance the existing community asset, the school. Now take a look. Note the high hip roof, the gables, the large palladium window on the central gable, all give the fire station a sense of grandeur and character. It complements the school, and together, they help give the neighborhood a sense of community. But time moves on. And this fire station has become obsolete. New fires require new firefighting equipment. So how do you save a community asset that has become obsolete? Well, saving a building is a lot easier said than done. And yet there are people who are willing to try. This past summer, we ran into Sally and Bill Ruxnitis. Sally runs the florist shop next door. And between Bill and Sally, private citizens, they're going to try to put life back into this old fire station. Things were kind of up in the air with this building since the fire company moved up to the new station up on McEwen Road, uh, it, it was kind of 
you know, natural that, you know, we'd be interested in it being right next door. One of the things, uh, the building is on the National Historic Register, and as you can see, the school across the street uh, is complete and is absolutely beautiful. And ultimately, what we'd like to do is complete this, uh, restoring it on the outside and having it go along with the school. Uh, as you know, it's a focal point when you drive into the village from either direction. Uh, you see the school, but you also see the firehouse. So it's going to be a, a real, real nice addition once we restore it. The main thing is the history. I mean, we really want to preserve the history of the fire station and then be able to bring in some of the history of Quinsigaman Village, too. We like to have uh, changing displays and uh, be able to bring people in not only to, to buy something, but also to, to come in and see a little bit of the history of Quinsigaman Village. So that's type, kind of our plan. This is where the firemen played cards and taught many of us a game, many games of cards. They never played poker that I know of, and I never saw any sign of any gambling here. It was just uh, playing cards to pass the time of day away. Now, this building brings a lot of memories back to you because the firemen, because your dad died so young, they kind of took a uh, father figure for you, didn't they? Right. They, uh, they kept us in tow. If we got out of hand, they'd give us a little whack and uh, probably wouldn't be allowed these days, but it didn't do us any harm at all. We had an awful lot of fun here. They did many things as we grew older. We had a in the winter time. We played football and baseball outside here where that parking lot is now. And we, in the winter time, we'd make a hockey rink out there and they'd flood it and we'd skate. And, so we have many memories, good memories, from as far back as I can remember. And of course, during Depression years, it was a, a clubhouse, probably clubhouse in quote, but many of the people who were out of work would uh, stay in this area and come in and visit. And even before that, of course, a lot of the old timers uh, would come with Grandpa Holst and they'd sit in here and chat with the firemen. It, so it was kind of a community gathering place, too. Metal ceilings are still in pretty decent shape. They require maybe a little sandblasting, a coat of paint, but that's what we want to bring all together mm -hmm. and maintain that look. And, and one of the things that we like to, to decorate the offices and the restore area is with the old pictures of the fire station and uh, we have some of the old original coats and hats and that's kind of the decor that we like to keep. Uh, one thing that we had available this past Christmas was a commemorative brass ornament of the Quinsigamond fire station that we sold to people with its original date of 1891 to 1892 when it was built. It means a lot to us. Not only do we live in Quinsig Village, you know, we have business interest here and, and we have this interest. Um, so we, we're, we remain committed and we're going to be committed here for quite some time. And, and not only for the fire station, but we're involved in the whole restoration process for all of Quinsigamond Village. We had attended all the charrette meetings that were earlier by the Blackstone Valley. National Heritage Corridor. National Heritage Corridor. That is a mouthful. <laughs> and um, we're excited to see that there's some work, st some studies starting on the visitor center. And we're also involved with the Worcester City planning with Alan Gordon. And we're excited that the city of Worcester is, is taking some notice down here in Quinsigamond Village. So, you know, not only will it be a, a great place to live, it'll be a, a nice place to have some retail stores and, and really bring it back to the, the way it was. So who does this preservation stuff anyway? Well, we've seen it can be ordinary citizens like Sally and Bill who take on the challenge of preserving our history through our buildings. But it also can be your local historical society, like the one here in East Douglas, Massachusetts, who manage, support, and preserve this wonderful 1835 general store, the Jenks Store. Now, the Jenks Store is a wonderful example of a community asset that also happens to be a repository of community history as well. Now, there are other preservationists out there who, at first glance, seem a little out of place. For example, your local chamber of commerce, a local contractor, 
and even your local neighborhood redevelopment corporation. All these people, believe it or not, can be great preservationists. So to prove my point, let's go and see. I'm standing here in the Bandanaka farm in Whitensville. It's an old working farm that uh, had tremendous economic value many years ago. And uh, now it has even more economic value because of the uh, location and proximity here to 146. The, the family faced a difficult challenge. How do you preserve our natural resources while supporting economic development? The Blackson Valley Chamber of Commerce, the local planning board and the town and the family work together to create a plan that fits. It's a perfect fit for the family, the region, and the valley because they're going to build a post and beam uh, structure that will fit, fit right into this nook here. They're going to serve wonderful ice cream. And what it does is, is that we have natural and historic preservation here at the site and we have economic development. This could be a model for the, for the Blackstone Valley in terms of what we face here uh, with the many challenges um, along this uh, new 146 corridor. My family came from um, South Carolina in the middle of the 50s because of the textile injury industry. There were plenty of jobs for everyone. There were more jobs than there were people. So it was a good thing for us to move from the farm and come here and that we, uh, we were very, very happy because there were jobs for the entire family. We even sent back to South Carolina for other members of the families. Uh, the teenagers had plenty of employment. It was a very good life here. And then what happened? Well, the textile industry decided to go to South Carolina. <laughs> and we were left here. And, and it, things went downhill for quite a while because of all the jobs that were going on. And uh, there were some major industries here, like Uniroyal, it closed. And half my family worked there. So of course, then they were unemployed. I grew up here in the neighborhood in the uh, 70s. I was a young kid. I went to the neighborhood school here. And in the mid 80s, uh, a lot of families who did own the homes uh, began to sell because of the uh, housing boom. And um, for about uh, that lasted for about five years until the uh, credit union failed in the 90s. And that's really when the neighborhood really took a turn for the worse. Initially, you were talking about safety issues. Mm -hmm. And you moved from safety issues to housing issues. How did that happen? Well, I, I think uh, the safety was more the concern of the neighborhood people, and WNDC came in with the housing. Boarded up houses was also a safety issue, which here's an agency that came into the neighborhood that was going to address that. Of course, if you have 30 boarded up houses, there go dark areas, no, no eyes to see. So the crime was up. But fill the houses, renovate the houses, fill the houses, get the eyes, get the children outside playing in the evening. Uh, crime looks for dark areas. There's no more dark areas, so crime leaves. You look at these houses, you really have maintained their historical nature. You I mean, look at them, it's wood, it's solid. How did you go about making sure that they were still historically correct or reflected the old neighborhoods the way they used to be? Well, I think that we have to give a little credit to our, uh, our director, mm -hmm. uh, Joe uh, there, uh, I think he, one of the things that he wanted to look at is uh, keeping some of the, the historical features. Uh, I guess we'd have to also give a little credit to our the architects also who uh, uh, chosen some of the, the, the colors that you see. And, you know, we wanted to try to um, uh, reflect some of the uh, historical colors that were used back in the early turn of the century. Not only that we're coming in and uh, reclaiming or restoring what once was here in the neighborhood that had beautiful homes, we're restoring that community value where people uh, get along and uh, uh, get out and work in their neighborhoods doing cleanups. Uh, right behind us here we have the uh, community orchard. Uh, we, we just don't want to just build homes. We, we want uh, to have family values and I think that's why we uh, try to make our homes, uh, the living rooms and the kitchens more big so the families can have more space together and, mm -hmm. and not, you know, little tiny home, you know, mm -hmm. apartments. 
That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Design with humanity, you know, because everybody hangs out in the kitchen. Well, don't they? definitely, Chuck. And if a mother has a window to be able to look out to, to see in the playground where her children is, she's content to stay in and do her housework and get the dinner ready and everything. And she knows that, you know, the children, she can look right outside the window and see the children play. And I think the community appreciates the uh, Woonsocket neighborhood development because they know that we are for the families here, not just renovating houses and selling homes. You have gotten the, the people who live here so committed to making this work. How'd you do that? Our executive director, Joe Garlick, who uh, seen uh, what could be done in this neighborhood and, and I think even more so had the vision that it could get back to where it wa once was, uh, even though after some of the neighborhood people have lost hope, you know, when they've seen over 35 to 40 abandoned houses mm -hmm. in the neighborhood. They were very delighted when WNDC came and started and that gave them hope to get out and help also. They said, well, there's a leader, I can certainly join and I can make a difference myself. And of course my family live here too and my grandchildren play in the park. So why shouldn't I get out and try to improve things? I'll, all we were looking for is someone to get started and someone that we can, we can help out. So the, the, fam the uh, community, they came together I can usually knock on a door at any given day and ask for help and they would say, sure, Irene, um, I'll be out, I'll be down to the office, give me an hour or so, or I'll send the children, Irene, put them to work and I'll be down later. <laughs> so, so it really is a nice sense of neighborhood here, isn't it? There's a message that you've learned here from the work you've done in this neighborhood about what, what can work here. Be a voice in your neighborhood, you know, uh, you, you can't really sit back and wait for um, something good to happen in your neighborhood. You have to be a part of that good. Union Station, Worcester, Massachusetts, a source of great civic pride during the early 20th century for its vast scale, elaborate design, and home to a very busy train terminal. Built around 1909 and modeled after a Roman basilica, the two ornate Baroque-style towers drew attention to the center of a bustling city. However, times change, interest wanes, Technology transforms transportation systems, and suddenly we have another classic building, a real community asset in a downward spiral of neglect. But here in Worcester, concerned citizens got together, fought tooth and nail to save and rehabilitate this great station. Now, look at these beautiful twin towers, visible from almost anywhere in the city. Well, this has been Ranger Chuck Arning with the National Park Service here in the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And these great community assets need to be more than just visually stimulating. They need to be viable, viable members of our community. Union Station needs to have people working and enjoying it. And while the work on the outside is impressive, the vitality needed to make this project successful on the inside is not. And it's such a shame. It has so much potential. Now, we're standing down here in Slatersville, in North Smithfield, Rhode Island, because they have demonstrated just what viability means. I'm standing behind the public library which used to be part of the old mill structure here. Below me are the raceways that brought water power to this mill. The town restored this mill and made it a viable member of its community. These great community assets and the dozens we haven't even talked about require our energy and our creativity if they are to survive. We clearly have the capacity to turn these treasures into viable community members. The question is, do we have the will? So until next time, I hope to see you in the valley.